10. A telemarketer. I know, we all know these exist, but like, I actually don't think anybody actually thinks about a telemarketer as an actual job. There are always the people that call you right as you're about to sit down for dinner being like, do you wanna buy this toy spork? And you're like, no, I don't wanna do that. I've seen people toy with them, I've seen people hang up the phone right away, like you know if you pick up the phone and no one is there right away, like hang up. If someone says hi, I'm calling on that, like you just hang up. They get told no in so many creative ways. It's almost like a special skill to be able to, <laughs> to, be able to receive that much rejection consecutively. Wow, it's like being an actor. <laughs> but many people depend on this job as they're living and experience verbal abuse from many customers. Having to endure that kind of negativity all day, every day, would be pretty hard to handle. So maybe we can be a little kinder. On top of that, they get paid most of the time on score-based systems, so they can't really take no for an answer until they've given it their best shot. So. Like, eh, just polite, be as polite as possible, but I get it, it's super annoying. Number nine, roadkill collector. Speaking of a crime scene cleaner, next up we have a roadkill collector. Yeah, this might be news for some of you who thought the squirrel you hit just like melted into the pavement after a few days of cars going over it. But no, this job actually exists and it's not Mm, ideal. The task is sometimes grueling because often the poor little babies are, you know, well in the middle of the road, so they have to run out and scrape and scoop the critter out of there, all while like avoiding all the cars coming at them, otherwise trying to make them roadkill as well. On top of that, considering the conditions in which they perished, the stench and scenery is enough to churn even a sewer rat's stomach, so. Number eight, a crime scene cleaner. Of course someone has to do this. It is definitely a job I believe exists. Though I never really thought of it existing, I just thought they would just clean it up. But anyways, it definitely exists because we would know if someone had died in the house we were about to buy because it would still be a mess. But imagine the things you would see and how awful that would be. How do you even get a job like that? I do know that there are a lot of crime enthusiasts on this site, so I googled it. Turns out there is a job application so you can just apply. It is for a company called Aftermath Services in Vancouver and it's a $500 sign on bonus. Guess they're really looking for workers. Whatever brave souls are out there, we thank you for your service. Also, here's a perk. Considering the nature of this work, it definitely sounds like it's recession proof. Number seven, watching paint dry. Do you remember that thing that camp counselors used to do in the whole camp? If they were like acting crazy, they'd get you to sit down all together and like watch the paint dry. And if somebody like, little Timmy spoke out, then you'd have to restart. Anybody else do that? Just me? Okay, <laughs> fun. Anyways, so imagine my surprise to learn that something that was used as a mild punishment is the actual job of a man named Keith Jackson. Jackson lived in the UK and his job was literally to watch paint dry. He worked for a paint manufacturer and had to determine how well the paint was drying. So according to Jackson, it actually had some pretty high stakes, and I quote, watching paint dry sounds quite easy, but it can be stressful at times. Unquote. The more you know. Number six, snake researcher. It shouldn't be a surprise to you that of course we are going to bring up Mike Rowe, the dirty job man of the hour. I like snakes. I feel like there are two kinds of people. The people who are like afraid of snakes, but not spiders, and the people who are afraid of spiders, but not snakes, you know what I mean? I'm the latter. So when I saw this job, I didn't think it would be awful at all, but it's nowhere near what you think. Mike Rowe says this is one of the grossest jobs he's ever done because, and I quote, to properly study the feeding habits of water snakes in Michigan, snake researchers pull large snakes from Lake Erie, squeeze them until they puke, then analyze their vomit to see what they've been eating. It's as disgusting as it sounds, but on the day in question, to add to the excitement, I was bitten no less than three dozen times. Annoying, bloody, and very dirty." Unquote. Mike Rowe, oh, we salute you. Number five, an animal inseminator. We basically collect the semen off them, we freeze it, we chill it, and we send that semen globally. Rather than having to take the stallion to the mare, you can ship it around anywhere. Okay, so this exists. Though this guy seems to be absolutely like loving his job, which is great. 
people who do this for a living are essential for breeding purposes, though it is definitely not for everybody. Without going into too much detail, I'm going to try to describe this job as creatively as possible. In many ways, this job requires the employee to act as both lover and stork for certain animals such as cows and horses. The reason it exists is for the convenience of better breeding because they don't have to travel a breed or wait for them to mate. So instead, they position themselves to catch their mini selves and then they manually inject them into to mares like cows, for example, and horses. So not a very romantic process, but then again, whatever gets the job done, I suppose. But the grossest part, like the grossest part, even if you can't get your head around the other bit, oftentimes the animal reacts to the injection of the baby juice by pooping really close to the inseminator's face. So like definitely not for the faint of heart. Number four, shark suit tester. This list is basically partially in honor of every dirty job Micro has ever done. So he's gonna be featured again. Why putting a synthetic body within a chainmail suit wouldn't be a viable option for testing this? Apparently it isn't. There are not many jobs Micro found difficult to muster courage for, but this job remains in his top five jobs he wouldn't do again. According to Roe, quote, the only way to see if a stainless steel shark suit works is to put one on and jump feet first into a full on feeding frenzy to be bitten by a variety of hungry sharks and shook like a tug toy for 60 feet below the surface. I did this job for shark week against my better judgment, but live to tell the tale. Not dirty, but straight up terrifying. I won't be doing it again, ever. Unquote. Like, Mike Rowe, if you ever watch the show Dirty Jobs, Mike Rowe has gone through a lot. Like, he went and checked out a bunch of different jobs, and he doesn't have to, even have to do each one for the rest of his life. He just tried a bunch of different ones. Great show, but if, like, that scared him, it sounds terrifying. That's not a job I would like to do. Number three, pet food taster. Ice cream taster, amazing. Chip flavor taster, yes please. Sommelier, sign me up. But did you know there was such a thing as a pet food taster? Good to know that at least the flavor profile is human approved for your pupper, but imagine tasting that for a living. Also, it is pet food, so it could be dog food, but it could also be like bird seed or bunny pellets. However, it does take a very highly skilled person to do it as it's a combination of research and taste. They have the job of evaluating a pet's nutritional value in their food and are tasked with finding ways they can improve that. But eventually, they do have to sample it, put it on a little bib. Yum. They evaluate the scent as it has to do with both human senses. After all, you don't want the house stinking like fish or dog food. And as well, and most importantly, for the pet. Thankfully, they do spit it out after reviewing the flavor, texture, and consistency. Unless it's really good. They probably just make that their lunch time. Number two, a chicken sexer. Uh, oh, what a title, you know? <laughs> what do you do for a living? I'm a chicken sexer. How do you bring that up to your in-laws? I'm not sure if my life is better knowing that the job of a chicken sexer actually exists, but for all the chicken that is consumed every day, it is really important. A chicken sexer's job is to distinguish the sex of a hatchling. Sounds okay so far, but it's how they do it that often gets really messy. The first version of this technique isn't so bad. Feather sexing is only done on broiler chickens that have a genetic mutation where female Female feathers grow faster, therefore they can kind of tell. But vent sexing is a little, you know, interesting. They have to hold a chicken a certain way and very gently squeeze the poop out so they can see the intestines. Then they can see the reproductive organs, which therefore determines the sex. This method was invented in the 1930s in Japan and though effective, not the prettiest job. But hey, 60K a year, not bad. Number one, last but not least, a sewer inspector. Number one, here we go. I think this is pretty self-explanatory, so if you want to skip ahead to liking and commenting portion of this video, then I won't blame you. But in the words of yet again, the one, the only, Mike Rowe, aside from sloshing through relentless chocolate tide, inspectors encounter a myriad of man-made products that shouldn't be flushed down the toilets along with roaches the size of thumbs and rats the size of bread loaves. It's hot, dirty, and too smelly to describe." Unquote. God! No thank you. Never gonna do that. I don't know if you could pay me enough. 
if I'm being honest. But you can make anywhere from 52 to 72 grand a year for this dirty job. And as you can probably guess, it is essential. It is a privilege to be able to flush away our problems. So, so to all those watching who may work as sewer inspectors or in the sewer industry, we salute you. And at number 10 is being a dancer. Ancient Egyptians loved their music and dance. They were celebratory, but also ritualistic at times. Farmers would dance to thank the gods for a good harvest. Dance groups would perform at banquets. People would go dance around the Nile in the lush season. The list goes on. Many men and women chose dance as a career, and it was a highly respected one. Dancing was considered an acceptable and normal part of life and even important to it. Most festivals were incomplete without it. In fact, dancing was such a revered career that dancers could start as a peasant and become a high status person from it. Just like being a celebrity in the way that people would go to see them perform. Women at the time were even more revered for their grace, elegance, and acrobatics. This career had seven types of dance. Gymnastic, movement, pair dancing, imitative dance, which was like acting like animals, group dances like a historic cheerleading squad, dramatic dance was female exclusive and rested in illustration, war dances, grotesque dance, and then religious chant dances at temples, and lyrical dance, which was usually a depiction of lovers. For number nine, jewelry making. Egyptians saw deep spiritual significance in their jewelry, but also had a love of aesthetics. And those two things combined to create some of the most unique and lavish jewelry found in history. Worn to ward off spirits, protect health, bring good luck, and more, there were even certain colors and designs that were associated to certain gods and powers. And so, Egyptian Egyptian jewelers followed very strict rules regarding the mystical aspects of their jewelry creations. While a woman usually would not be a metal worker in Egyptian society, it was very common for her to be making jewelry. The tools were smaller and the process required less heat and thus less danger for her. Metal work techniques included precious metal sheets that were cut and shaped, notched together. Wire work was accomplished through strip twisting. Pieces could be held together with this wire stripping system or crimping techniques. These strips were also how link chains were accomplished as well as the securing of beads or the backs of earrings. And for jewelry designed exclusively for burial, the metal was often quite thin, as the jewelry of the deceased was not subjected to the wares of everyday life. Precious stones, ivory, real flowers, and shells were all common ornaments, as was name engravements, but it was more common with royalty. Jewelry makers were women of high status due to these contributions and the revelry jewelry held in ancient Egypt. Number eight is its house vendors. Recognized as an ancient heritage profession, and was at its most popular during time periods of ancient Egypt where women were restricted from going out when married. These vendors would roam neighborhoods with buckets and baskets of product for sale. Clothing, perfume, fabric, snacks. Now, what was unusual is that the vendor was more often women than men. Walking the streets alone, making these sales because many married women weren't allowed to go out walking the streets alone to make sales. You see the irony. Anyways, this profession found great popularity in single women, and many also were called upon to act as nurses in homes of the wealthy when needed. The career is named Al Dalala, but the idea itself has long been extinct with the freedom for Egyptian women to roam commercial districts. Wig makers are number seven. Egyptians loved wigs for a reason that surprises many. It helped keep their heads cool. I mean, it also helped with hygiene and scalp pests and looking pretty, but the heat thing is what really gets folks. Many Egyptians had shaved or cropped hair and the mesh like base of a wig versus a headscarf allowed the body heat to still escape. And as said, wigs were also a great shield from lice or other invasive bugs. The hair used in the construction of wigs and hair extensions was always human and was either an individual's own hair or had been traded or bought. Hair itself was a valuable commodity ranked alongside gold and incense in a count list from the town of Cahoon, which puts emphasis on the popularity of wigs. When hair was collected for a wig, it was thoroughly combed and then sorted into lengths individually. The Egyptians invented a variety of hairdressing tools and the wig makers would take the time to braid or coil the hair depending on the wig style, coating each with warm beeswax and resin fixatives so that it would harden when cool. The job itself isn't unusual, more so the booming industry it had. Wigs weren't worn to this extent anywhere else at the time and while yes they were functional against the sun, they were more so aesthetic than anything. Individual braid and extensions could also be attached to someone's scalp for aesthetics, the way that box braids, twists, 
low locks and many other ethnic hairstyles are accomplished today. Wigs were made in a type of factory setting. Archaeologists have uncovered the remain of wig factories, wig boxes have been found in tombs, and multiple mummies have been found with wigs or braided in extensions. Number 6 we meet our ladies of the night. Unlike most ancient and even modern civilizations, selling intercourse is illegal or was highly governed. In ancient Egypt this wasn't even close to the case, but rather the opposite in a peculiar way. Women who worked in the sexual industries were considered divine and respectable, as their career was considered to please the gods. They earned high status and lived in luxury. Working freely and openly, these ladies adorned themselves with red lipstick and eye makeup that differentiated themselves from other women. They were also tattooed, diamond shaped dots along the thighs and on the fingers or images of the god Bess. When the French invaded, they brought STIs, and they spread rapidly through the brothels and this prompted the French authorities to introduce a law forbidding French troops from entering the brothels or having these ladies in their rooms. Guess those ladies were hard to resist because anyone who offended the law received death penalty. Number 5 are the wet nurses. Wet nurses are found in all statuses and were for all statuses. One common denominator though is that the career kind of really sucked. Pun intended. So, first their social status was always determined by the status of who they were breastfeeding. Royal family, congrats on your special privileges, statues, private quarters, and your own tomb in the family pyramid. Also, her family would receive special perks as an extension of her. Now, royal families only wanted high status wet nurses, and while it's not clear how they were chosen, evidence suggests some kind of blood tie or faint familiar relation. Most wet nurses were from marginalized families in lower socioeconomic statuses and worked under conditions and pre definitive ways. Ages. Wet nurse requirements for any status were intense. She'd have to have given birth at least twice, have a large but healthy body due to the belief that large bodies were more nourishing. Despite that, her breasts should be medium. Too small, not enough food. Too big, the baby's spoiled. In addition to all of these prerequisites, the wet nurse should be sweet tempered, affectionate, and responsive to her charge. She should also abstain from intercourse because it could reduce her affection towards a child, and they also said no alcohol. A good call knowing what we know now. Wet nurses were women exploited for the products of their bodies. As slaves they were coerced for their milk, as lower social status women they were employed for their bodies to enhance their inadequate domestic status. Even her own household suffered physically and monetarily if a wet nurse defaulted or failed a contract. On the same page, surrogates are number 4. This is a widespread practice in Egypt. The first story of surrogacy found in Genesis 16 of the Bible was the story of infertile Sarah having Egyptian Hagar carry her child for her and her husband Abraham. Even Egyptian pharaohs had used concubines to produce heirs. They often married their sisters or aunts, and children born of these marriages were most of the time not in great or functional health and wouldn't survive. Any child born of a concubine for a pharaoh was accepted as his lawful offspring. Now, they were quite limited in their rights and they could only inherit the throne in case of the absence of another more entitled heir. Surrogates experienced similar contracts and status leveling as wet nurses. They were desired to be mothers already, have a bigger, healthier body. And naturally beauty was a desired element as well. Women of low status who made a career of surrogacy often died in childbirth or from hemorrhages due to the repetitive birthing process, but for some it was the only career they could have. Priestress is number 3, and so while it was a male dominated field, many women were employed as a priestress or a high priestress at the temples around Egypt. Mostly from upper status, many were married to the priests which they owed their position in society. Despite this, they played roles in the temple rituals, such as servicing goddesses Hathor, Neith, and Paket, or working as dancers, musicians, singers, and acrobats in the temple. The most important priestress was known as the God's Wife Amun. This woman was usually the daughter of the pharaoh or sometimes his wife. She usually held a very high position in court and performed important rituals to honor the god Amun. The priestress was in charge of managing the gods' affairs, attending to ritual dances and performances, shaking their rattles and rattling their necklaces, which were long and heavily beaded objects. By the beginning of the New Kingdom in 1550, the title Chantress of Amun was used, and it was usually the wives of the priests who gained these elevated positions as well. The concept of a woman as a priest was unheard of in many kingdoms. A high priestess and the reverence and traditions of female gods being led by women were unusual to outsiders of Egypt who oftentimes restricted most priestly activities to just men. Number 2 is Professional Mourners. Ok, so here's a weird one. Professional or paid mourning is an occupation not only found in Egypt, Egypt, but in China, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Europe. This practice is literally paying a stranger to attend a funeral to lament, deliver a eulogy, help comfort the family, entertain, or lay on the ground wailing. There's some range here, depends on what kind of funeral you want to have. 
These paid mourners made ostentatious displays, messy hair and smudged makeup, wailing, pounding on the ground or their chest, throwing themselves about as they smeared dirt and sand all over their body while they screamed. It's a full spectacle. Now, another depiction of the paid mourners in Egypt is a little more chill. Two women impersonating the goddesses Isis and Nephthys. They were believed to play a special role in someone's death. Most inscriptions of a funeral where they are present as paid mourners, they are on each side of the corpse and their bodies are fully shaved. These women also had to be childless and have a tattoo of either Isis or Nephthys name on their shoulder. Most evidence of professional mourning is seen in pyramids and tomb inscriptions such as women holding their bodies dramatically in sorrow, braced over a casket with tears flowing. If you were a theater kid, this was definitely the type of job for you. And number one, it's the female physician. Egypt is a difficult one with historians. There's been a lot of largely ignored discoveries due to the opinions of those who found them. The evidence of women in ancient Egyptian medical fields is part of that because as it turns out, their physicians were actually primarily women. Evidence shows women in the medical profession going back into early dynastic period Egypt when Marit Ptah was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 BCE. She was the first female doctor known in world history, but there is another unnamed female physician who is listed to be the head of the Temple Neith Medical School in 3000 BCE, so maybe not. But either way, the first female doctor was in ancient Egypt. Women were highly respected throughout Egypt's history and many of their goddesses represented facets of health. Neith has been associated with the invention of birth and Hathor represents fertility. Four deities associated with healing are Heka, Sekhmet, Serket and Nephritim, which are all female. So, bizarre claims you may have heard that no women are involved in Egyptian medicine don't accord with the values of their civilization, which were incredibly equitable. By this reasoning, there were no women involved in anything of no anywhere in the world until the modern era, because history books make no mention of their contributions. But it's all up to say. Number 10, Bounty Hunter. Wanted dead or alive! The kind of thing that instills an idea of a character that would go out into the wilderness alone to hunt down criminals like Texas Cheddar over there and would be despised by all those they encountered. But that's not actually how it really was. You see, bounty hunters as we think of them today weren't really like that in the 1800s. Bounties were usually taken up by public peace officers, private detective agencies, or companies like Wells Fargo and Co. Many sheriffs and marshals, such as myself, Sheriff Stringbean, took up these bounties to make up for the little amounts of money they make from their day jobs. The actual term bounty hunter referred to mercenaries who would join up with an army for the bonus of enlisting. On top of that, the reward for capturing criminals like Texas Cheddar wasn't even called a bounty. It was actually called a bail. Sorry to ruin your day. Number 9. Gravedigger What does a monster truck and a weird dude from Kakariko Village have in common? If you said the foundation blocks that made up my childhood, then you win a prize. What's the prize? A big old kiss from me. Mm. In all reality though, towns in the Old West were interesting places, where there were always two constants sand, and folks would probably end up in the ground, or that sand. So after the proper proceedings had taken place when someone croaked, it was time to dig a hole. Or in these poor souls cases, a lot of holes. Cholera outbreaks would keep a grave digger busy for days. However, I thank the grave diggers for their service. I mean, someone had to do it. People like to give them a bad rap because they spend all their time with cadavers. That doesn't mean they're weird social outcasts. Well, except for Dompe and, and Seth from Red Dead Redemption and well, the ones from Hamlet, those guys are pretty weird actually. Oh boy, maybe we should just keep our distance from them. I don't know, I'm getting out of here. Number eight, saloon owner. Saloons are about as synonymous with the Old West as a single tumbleweed blowing in the wind, moving from stage left to stage right. Just about anyone could be a saloon owner too, from Festus down the street to the previous sheriff to a fancy gambler. The saloons of the Old West outnumbered churches 100 to one, and are any of us really surprised? You'd see one general store, one doctor, if you're lucky, and then like three saloons all on the same street. It's actually probably one of the most usual jobs on this list. It was also one of the most accessible jobs, usually being what people turned to when other avenues of employment ran dry. It would even be what you did while saving up money to buy farmland or to run for your office in your government. And in a town where everyone and their moms knows you as the guy who serves the liquor, you ain't gonna have a hard time getting elected. Ah, I kind of want to be a barkeep now. Number 7. Lady of the Evening. I talk about these ladies a lot, I know. Not because I want to, but because that's history, baby. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm window shopping only these days anyways. 
That's just the way she goes. A wise man once said, sometimes she goes, sometimes she doesn't. Way she goes, boys. When we think back and look at the Old West, you think of all the hardworking men and women who made the frontier possible. If it wasn't for those pioneers, we might not have the West Coast today. That means no vegan food. Ooh. That being said, the brothels and ladies who laid down their lives are a huge part of that history. Some brothels became so wealthy that they even would invest back in their towns, buying schools, medical buildings, that kind of thing. The truth of the matter is, no matter how greasy it might seem, it just wouldn't be the wild, wild west with a little girl power. Number six, a banker. Look, it ain't really unusual, but she gets shot at a lot. Bank robberies were not just in movies, no sir. To be a banker these days came with the territory of inviting unwelcome weapon-wielding bandits to hold you up. Apart from robberies, these banks had pretty much zero regulation too, so fraud and mismanagement was pretty commonplace. It's almost safer to keep your savings in a vault at home. Almost. A lot of the time, these banks were just a couple of fellers in town who teamed up, pulled their money together, and opened a community bank. You can kinda guess how this probably wouldn't be the most trustworthy of monetary dispositories. But they were absolutely essential for some people, especially those in the cattle business, where you would see around $50,000 to $100,000 exchange hands in some of those transactions. That's a lot of money back then. Heck, that's a lot of money right now. To me, at least. Applications for a sugar mama will be received in the comments below. Number five, gambler. You gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and know when to walk away. Anyone who spends time in front of a slot machine will tell you that it can be a dangerous game. Many have claimed one at big, all whilst envelopes with red print pile up at the front door. Final notice? Pfft. That means another spin, baby. Well, this is a similar story of the Old West, but instead of a one-armed bandit, there were actual bandits with two arms uh, and guns. <laughs> Yikes. It's a game of poker, lies, bluffs. Playing the wrong hand could wind up turning sour. The gamblers are the type of guys who roll into town in the shiniest clothes and stay in the best places. And right before you notice you've been cheated at the poker table, he's already cashed out. Number four, milliner. Hey, I have a proposition. So we have hats for men, right? Now, what if we employ someone for the sole purpose of, get this, making hats for women? Well, Jebediah, uh, we have that. That would be the uh, milliner down the road there. If you were a high fashion lady in the 19th century, then you would have definitely come into contact with these fine sellers and makers of women's hats. They were usually located in bigger cities where the higher end families would either live or spend their time. And you should take a look at some of these hats. They are works of art. Maybe some are a little whack, but hey. Number three, con men. You'll like this one, guys. You're gonna like this one. There's nothing more peculiar, more strange, more theatrical than a snake oil salesman. Where would John Marston be without Nigel West Dickens? I don't know. They were traveling salesmen who were swindlers, liars, crooks, thieves, selling pseudoscience products to folks who just didn't know any better. It would work something like this. I would show up in town with my traveling cart of wares and mysteries. There, standing on a small crate, like the one I'm standing on right now, I would give the town my best sales pitch. <clears throat> Introducing Dr. Andrew's new and improved Life Bigger Supplements. Here before you find folks is a tall bottle of rejuvenation made for the finest ingredients across the globe. Ginger, ginseng, milkweed, red sage, English mace, golden currant, and as if that weren't enough, Dr. Andrew's new and improved Vigor Supplement has the minerals and vitamins that carry you through a long day's work in the fields. Vitamin A through K, copper, iron, potassium. This bottle here is not to only put a pep in your step and refill your stamina, but also cures what ails you. A proven cure for fever, chills, indigestion, cholera, yellow fever, dysentery, and even known to help heal broken bones. Modern science has brought this gift to you today, ladies and gentlemen. And all you have to do now is say yes. Say yes to rejuvenation and yes to Dr. Andrew's new improved Vigor Supplement. I think you guys get the point. $49.99. Number two, a photographer. Want to never smile for eternity? Get your picture taken in the Old West. During the 1860s and 70s, the frontier was a wondrous, exotic place, which made it an excellent place to be a photographer. Sure, you had people who could draw and paint the landscapes and the people of the place, but people were distrusting of artists' interpretations. Pictures sold you the place exactly as it was. The high quality images were in high demand. Every government survey and all the major railroads had official photographers. Photographs made for excellent evidence of plots of land, mines, and other structures for investors. But that's boring. More excitingly, 
common people with a bit of money would often go and get really not grim, not boring pictures taken like this. Number one, gunslinger. I bet you when someone says Wild Wild West, the first thing you think of is a gunslinger. A cowboy riding his horse into the sunset with his cowboy hat and big iron on his hip. Every step into the saloon is echoed with the jingle jangle of spurs on the heels of his leather boots. No, this isn't a country singer concert. This is the Old West, the life of a lonesome gunslinger and outlaw, riding town to town, either getting away from trouble or looking for it, really. The same kind of folks who got their name up on a wanted poster. Just be sure Sheriff String being in around to look for you, that's all I can say. Also, fun fact, bounty hunting is still allowed in the US today. That's crazy, who would've thought? At number 10, town crier. I'm sure you've heard of the town crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the town crier, you might also think of the famous hear ye, hear ye that is associated with the speeches of the town criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the town crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The town crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye, hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye, 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 which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 9, Water Carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything, we have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out to depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 8, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord and served as a Reeve for a one year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number 7, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribe so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. 
This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now, these things had to be cleaned out periodically, and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits, and so they would be given a large ladle, and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been, and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare, so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now, as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the Middle Ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of, and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the Middle Ages, and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently, people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, Cupbearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cup bearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cup bearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number two, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale, and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business, but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the ale wife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number one, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out, and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. Number 10, knocker upper. All right, sounds a little different than its actual purpose. Hear me out. Alarm clocks, they're not great, right? They suck, no doubt about it. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real life person. 
What does that look like? What does that sound like, rather? That's 6 a.m. That person is called a knocker upper, a person employed solely to wake up workers at mills and factories on those early morning shifts. Now, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows, that sounds like the best job ever, right? I can't close the list with this one. This is number 10, for sure. It's kind of fun. If you had this job, well, you're probably not alive anymore. I don't know, unless you live in a weird town. The people at the time were a lot friendlier back then than they are now, so, you know, I'm sure the knocker upper came around today. It'd be a little different. They'd probably be on World Star the next day. Knocker uppers back in the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for waking me up. I would have lost $14. Thank you. It was a big deal. It was definitely a big deal. Number nine. The Linkerman. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, if you were traveling alone at night, well, you'd probably get lost. Cause yeah, even London now would get lost, you know what I mean? So that's where a Linkerman would ideally come into play. They'd come in to save your night. What they would do is they would carry with them a torch to help guide your way home. They'd be like, hey, follow me, I know these streets, and then you'd do it, I guess? It's a little scary. At the end of this impromptu tour, they'd of course expect a little tip from you. Of course, of course, thank you for lighting my path and getting me home, cheers. Here's one nickel, it's actually a lot back then. Here's one penny, there we go. They weren't so bad, they were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to B, whilst also being able to see one foot in front of the other, that doesn't hurt, especially in Victorian London. You gotta step on a dirty rat, that'll be gross. It's like a friend walking you home, only you don't know them, and it's the Victorian era, so probably pretty unsafe. 50-50 if you're gonna make it. And their charge was usually one farthing or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker man, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from that era. And there were even a couple famous linker men, famous linker mans, like Lawrence Casey, for example, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Imagine that, your arm must be so strong with that lamp all day. Ooh, it's just like, oh, I can't put it down. Number eight, ghost photography. 1800s ghost photography. Apparently it was a theme or a, a vibe, I don't know, but there are people that would take the photos of these ghosts. So at one point you would be hired as a professional ghost photographer. On paper, here's your tax returns. That's what I did. The camera, of course, was a hot new invention back then. So tales of ghosts and spirit were easily believed, especially when you have a photo of a see-through woman. That probably helps sell your tail for sure. Like, up oh, here she is. It's like, that's that's mom. That's definitely not, you just did that in the back room. That's, I don't believe you. A big name in the ghost game was that of William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, so now he's for sure a ghost. Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. Yeah, this British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a spirit. Imagine that, imagine a day where somebody was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and they also posed for photo ops with ghosts. Like, can you pick a lane? Science or not, what are we doing here? Number seven, grave designs. Graves, but make them cool, you know? Customize your own pit in the ground. That's fun, that's grim. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, pretty much anything floating around your mouth and eyes, it was spreading and it was bad. Not a good thing to ingest. Not an ideal time in history. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark new fun trend. Yeah, here we go. The safety coffin. Yeah, let's uh, make your own coffin, DIY. These coffins, God forbid, you were buried alive while these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Yeah, some Tony Stark guy in the back's like, if you push this, the body will pop back out and come to life. It's like, really? A lot of these coffins were built with extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire, the safety backup wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground, and attached to a bell on the outside on the ground. So if somebody was walking by and they heard a bell ringing beside a gravestone, first of all, it's haunting, well, they know something's up and they can get them out. But folks would get creative with their safety coffins. They would ask the inventor to make them crazy things, like a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He had some odd requests. He passed away in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his coffin after he passed. The special door would reveal a layer of glass. Yeah, so if anybody saw any condensation, well, you know, he's still alive and get him out. Only he wasn't alive. And now we just have the world's scariest exhibit. Just a real life dead man. Let's close that back up forever. I don't want a glass coffin. That's disgusting. Number six, rat catcher. I mean, obviously, you know what's going to happen with the name the rat catcher. It's going to make a lot of you out there squirm in your seats. And I apologize in advance. Hit that thumbs up, you know, let's even out the energy. Rats in Victorian England. 
they were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your home probably had a dirty, fat rat just sitting there with its weird teeth looking at you. From the basement to the pipes, everywhere. It was literally a, it was a big problem. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So imagine that. So of course, there's a problem. So of course, where there's a problem, there's now a job, right? Someone's got to do something about it. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era. I mean, of course, brave souls. And they were highly praised in society, but the job, obviously, wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and we'd catch them and you'd often have to kill thousands of rats every single year. And then deal with that. I don't even know how you deal with those bodies. Let's say bones, ew. More often than not, rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats, so. You have your own little animal posse hunting down other animals. You would feel pretty good. You'd feel like a, the king of animals almost. Probably not, eh? It's probably a disgusting job. You probably hate it every day. Number five, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing back in the Victorian era, obviously. I mean, they definitely existed. The first lighter was invented in 1823, but it wasn't like the ones we have now. Not like those Bix that still don't work. It wasn't a portable thing. The first match was invented in 1805, but it kind of sucked. And the first friction activated match came around much later in 1826. This one here changed the game for good. They were made with white phosphorus, which is of course extremely toxic, but they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was of course done by people, young women. It was only women that had to do this and in the worst of conditions, of course. And before you ask, no, they didn't understand protective gear. Well, they did a bit, but even so, women didn't get that kind of luxury, right? They didn't get that treatment. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would probably end up ingesting said white phosphorus. The entire shift. History is horrible. Number four, resurrectionalist. All right, back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of their line, right? You're not gonna go dig up someone's wife and be like, hey, mind if I study here? He's like, no, please. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around to begin with, which led to a good price for bodies that were in, well, reasonably good condition to, you know, study up close, other than being, you know, deceased and disgusting. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, sure, I'll admit that. Now you've probably created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves. And that's exactly what happened. People would become their own resurrectionalist. It's a cool name for a god-awful profession if you want to call it that. The problem was so bad that people had to protect, like they had to guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. Or else these guys would come in and try and dig them up and sell your Nana for like 20 bucks. You have to stay there for four nights and guard her. That's great. No one should have to do that. The Victorian era sucked. No one should have to do that or this next one here. Number three, train engine cleaner. Yeah, this one's gonna suck. It sounds yucky already. For this job, you were required to get into, of course, pretty tough positions to, well, clean the engine of a train. Train engine cleaners would have to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out all that coal that was left over. Yeah, as if shoveling the coal in wasn't bad enough, now some guy's gotta crawl under and shovel it all out. Nope. They go underneath the train with a dusty ash pan and they work away all day long and nights. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains and then spend their nights climbing into the same furnace to clean it out. Every time I watch the Polar Express, it's always so magical, you know, it's always a great time. But even on the Polar Express, there's a guy shoveling coal all night long on Christmas Eve. You know what I mean? That's how bad this job is. Magic can't even save it. Couldn't even picture a worse job to have with this goofy back. Imagine that, imagine me doing this all day. No way, I'm gonna make it one week. Number two, funeral mute. Ah uh, yes, death. Happened quite a lot back then. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, you know, don't drop them, hmm? all that kind of stuff. Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Now Oliver Twist, one of the lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. All of her twists is like, this one sucks. This one really sucks. Mutes were required to dress, of course, in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would be to, well, to stand and mourn and not say a thing the entire time. You'd have to stand at the door of the recently deceased home and just welcome death. Just embrace it. You have to be death. The mascot for death is now you. Horrible. In Victoria, London too, you're gonna breathe in a fresh rotting body. Nice, that's good. I have about four days left, thank you. And after that point, you would lead the coffin all the way to the graveyard, nice and slow, like you were uh, leading a marching band. Only it's not music, it's death behind you. And finally, number one, a chimney sweep. I remember doing this when I was a kid. Okay, I got some questions now. I'm gonna make some phone calls after this list. I had to do this when I was a kid, but back then it was a lot worse. It wasn't a chore, it was an actual job. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young men. Guys, I can't say anything else here, but they were young lads. That's it. History is pretty horrible, right? 
you could fill it in. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that made it officially illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. Nice, I was 18 cleaning my chimney at home. I had no idea, I could have busted out this law and been like, actually, three more years, dad. See ya, just moonwalk out of there. I'm not cleaning anything, just the kitchen for now. I'm not using that tiny little brush. Why do all chimney sweeps have a tiny brush? Give them a bigger brush, you know? Starting our list off at number 10, a banker. Today, online banking is easy, right? It's a little bit too invasive at times. I don't know. I get an email from my bank. It's like, Mr. McWaters, do you want to provide for your family? I'm like, chill, relax. Back in the old west, you didn't get a courtesy check-in email. You didn't have overdraft. In fact, the United States national banking system, well, it didn't even exist until 1863. Before then, you'd have what were called wildcat banks. And well, these were pretty fun. Here we go. What they would do is wildcat banks, they would take deposits for a short amount of time, collect your life savings, and then unannounced randomly, they would disappear overnight. Just take all your money and then run for the woods. How horrible is that? Imagine going to the bank the next day and it's gone. The bank's just not there. You're standing there with a card. Like, um, hello? Where did I put this in? You're telling me they pretended to be bankers for months at a time? Fake mustache, oh hello sir, good morning. Stamping things that aren't even real. They did all of that and then they just ran away with all of your money. That's wild, I get it now, I get it, the wild west. After 1863, a noble profession was to work at a bank, you know, and not screw people over for thousands of dollars. The Hudson Bay Company, Wells Fargo, these are all names that began because of these fake Looney Tune wildcat banks. So next time you see your bank call, be thankful. Don't be stressed, be thankful. They've got your back. They're not gonna run away overnight. Number nine, railroad work. This is one of the few jobs from the Old West that I actively see every single day coming to work. Living downtown, they're always adding trains and bridges and not finishing any of them. And ideally, you don't want any toxic substance traveling down those lines, right? Fingers crossed. Well, back in the Old West, railroads were meant to assist the booming mining and ranching industries. Thing is, there weren't enough hands. There was not enough to keep up with the rate that they needed to. Like, who's gonna build a railroad? You know, who was the first person? Railroad workers, monthly, you'd make around $1,000, and this brought a wave of immigrants to the West. The Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads, they all lay over 1,700 miles. Now, making this actual railroad, it destroyed the bodies of these workers, but without it, American history would not be the same. Couldn't imagine making a railroad. That is exhausting. Number eight, ranch work. Alrighty, I can't do yard work. I don't know if you can tell by my physical being, but I can't lift a brick. My back doesn't allow me to reach the floor. A weird curve in the back, I don't know. Pulling weeds physically hurts my soul. Or maybe I'm just lazy. One of the two, I don't know. Either way, the Old West would have been the end of Taylor McWaters. To be a cowboy, it meant lots and lots of ranch work. It wasn't all yees and haws and kicking around. A lot of the time, you were protecting your cattle. That's stressful, right? All that meat just sitting there in the 1800s, good luck. Cowboys earned between 25 to $40 a month. Yeah, which sounds laughable now, but today that would be around $1,500 a month, which is fine. I mean, for a cowboy, I don't know, it's a bit, less than. Do cowboys get sick days? Probably not, they probably just get sick. Number seven, blacksmith. All right, close your eyes and imagine a blacksmith. Just any blacksmith from any time. Is he bald? Does he have a massive beard? Is he incredibly strong and wildly intimidating? Yeah, that checks out. That's what a lot of them look like. Missing teeth, banging something pretty loud. That's a blacksmith. Frontier times were almost a golden time for blacksmiths, believe it or not. Hammers, horseshoes, new railroads, it checks out. No, they didn't need any chain mail, but a saddle, wouldn't hurt, that's for sure. We could use a saddle. They would earn up to $200 a day. Blacksmiths were always busy in the Old West. They doubled as auto repair services really at the same time. I mean, I don't know. A guy comes in with a busted up carriage. Well, now you're a mechanic. Yeah, go fix this wooden car. Good luck, you have one day. Here's 10 bucks. Number six, journalism. Believe it or not, the newspaper business cleaned up shop back in the frontier. Everyone wanted to know what the tea was. Tuscan, Arizona, for example, back in the day, back in 1831, that one town had five different newspapers. Yeah, yeah, even though there are only 465 residents, there are five different papers. That's stressful. How do you keep up with that much news? I mean, to be fair, before radio and television, yeah, there's probably lots to talk about all day long. That's pretty much all you can do, just talk all day long, so I get it. The industry provided jobs as well. It's very much like YouTube. Here, there's writers, there's hosts, the design and print staff, we have editors. It was a little easier than laying down a railroad, that's for sure. So when it came to jobs, yeah, journalism wasn't that bad. Definitely better than doing anything that has to do with this motion, that's for sure. Number five, 
mining. A study done at a mine in Butte, Montana found that miners were dying from tuberculosis a lot, like 10 times more than they should be. Not should be, but you get what I'm saying. The mining industry is crazy dangerous. Safety was often overlooked and the health of these miners was, well, not existent at the time. The first gold rush was back in 1799. This kicked off everything. A young man named Conrad Reed, he found this bright yellow rock he had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, actually used it as a door stopper. Yeah, the 17 pound nugget of gold just keeping a swift breeze rolling through. It's worth a bit more than a door stopper today, and this actually ended up changing the entire industry. Gold mining got so popular that Congress had to build the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina alone. It's pretty cool. You have to make a mint? That's how much money you're making? Buddy, I want a mint. Number four, law enforcement. Of course, this too was a little different back in the Old West. There are not many body cams back then, I'll tell you that for free. Movies and television, they like to show the Old West as a lawless, root and tootin' time. And while sure, some of that is true, it wasn't as terrible as we think. Like A Million Ways to Die in the West, Red Dead Redemption, it wasn't that crazy because before any formal law enforcement agency did pop up, everybody was a bounty hunter, right? Why not? There's nothing else to do. Go lay a bunch of bricks or go catch a bad guy. 50-50, both are quite dangerous. Eventually, positions like that of a US Marshal began to pop up more and more, and well, now there's a bit more order to the system, that's for sure, a bit, just a little bit. Number three, barkeep. All right, I love pubs, big old fan of pubs. I've never been to a Wild West rootin' tootin' pub, but I'm in no rush. They always have weird drinks like venom snake juice or whatever, like spider ale. I'm like, I don't want any of these poisons. How about a beer? Just a beer, thanks. Bars in the Wild West, eh, not so fun. Not a lot of open mics going on back then in the 1800s. No karaoke night back then. See, back then, these saloons were just for business. That's it. You don't have a mustache and a business plan, get out. In the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel. Can you imagine that? In the Yukon, their shot of whiskey was 50 cents a pop. Now, that was a lot back in the day, but if you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in, I don't know, Colorado, it'd be a lot cheaper. Pretty ruthless. That's rootin' tootin' ruthless. The odd time you would have poker, dice, maybe some guy in a piano with some jazz fingers, sure, but most of the time, business only. When saloons first popped up, up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time, it was only reserved for lawmen, miners, or gamblers. If you don't have any of those three, you're thirsty. Go gamble, go grab a dice and come back. Number two, resurrectionalist. Yeah, you don't see a lot of these guys around anymore, eh? I wonder, wonder where they all went. A resurrectionalist is exactly what it sounds like. It's very gross, you're trying to bring someone back to life, I guess. Not really. These guys were responsible for digging up dead bodies, and then they would sell them to medical schools in the West. Now, I remind you, this was the late 1820s, so yeah, it was fine, I guess. This practice began in Edinburgh, Scotland. The medical science community was on the up and up, but in order to study new medicines, you know, to avoid the next plague or the next toxin rolling through your system, they needed these guys to come in and do the dirty work. Today, the medical community is a bit different. We're a bit, you know, smarter with things, but hey, never say never. A resurrectionalist might come back to life and be a new profession. How ironic. And finally, number one, medicinal showmen. Ah, uh, yes, we'll end on this note. Step right up and see something that doesn't work. A fake product. Yes, here we go. I'm doing a fake shoe. A fake shoot? A fake show. I don't know. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s specifically, they had what's called medicinal showmen, right? You won't believe your eyes. You have ste uh, strep throat? Come on up. Here we go. Definitely gonna fix that. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, whatever. But it was all about the pitch. That's pretty much all they had. They would have pawns, like their buddies, run ahead into town and then plant themselves in the audience before these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman doctor arrives, he randomly picks an ill patient that he knew was there, and then boom, just like that, he's cured. Almost like a magic show, right? Some would think, full of lies. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made by John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, and it was wildly popular. They toured with this elixir. They had to tell everybody in every town. They said it could treat any illness, but in reality, it was just a laxative. Just, uh, just a mess, just a show, really. So don't believe everything you hear, except for today. Today, we're a bit smarter. Back then, not quite. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the leech collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. Common cold? 
Have I got a solution for you? Bloodletting, especially by way of bleach, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required waiting in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who was trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. In our number 9 spot today, we have the fuller. Wool is a clothing staple. It's been used for centuries, but back in medieval times, there was a disgusting part of the job that thankfully doesn't exist anymore, thanks to the invention of modern chemistry. Wool is naturally waterproof due to the fact that it contains oils that have been distributed from the sheep's skin. And these oils are what made the entire harvesting, carding, spinning, and weaving processes possible in these times. This is all fine and well, but the trouble comes in after all of that, because the cloth at the end of it all was coarse and easily frayed. And this is where the job of a fuller came in. They were tasked with removing the oil from the cloth. Okay, a little alkaline solution, no problem, right? Well, yeah. Except for in these times, the most accessible and cheap alkaline solution was stale urine. Yep, just a bunch of old pee. A fuller had to take this new woven material, put it into a tub full of old pee from who knows where, and then you stomp on it with your feet. And then you get no shower at the end of it, either. What's a carpenter without his tool belt, right? What I mean is that fullers were also responsible for collecting their own pee to use for the wool. So they often needed to head to all the local public toilets and private homes to collect it. Just gets worse. In our number 8 spot today, we have the groom of the stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title, it weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean, it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times, kings were looked on almost as if they were gods, you know, it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries, it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facilities. This is where the groom of the stool comes in, this high level noble men would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health, as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. In our number 7 spot today, we have the nightman. This is definitely one of the shittiest jobs from the medieval times, and I mean that quite literally. Also referred to as gong farmers, these people had the unfortunate job of cleaning out all of the human waste from the cesspits in the castle walls, which they would then transport to a pre-arranged location where it would be buried. These cesspits were the medieval equivalent to a septic tank, and they were usually located on the lowest level of the castle. The nightmen would end up digging through weeks, months, just sometimes even years of disgustingness, and they were motivated to gather as much as possible possible considering the fact that they were paid by the ton. Imagine, that's a frightening amount of work. The job was also quite hazardous, too. I mean, if we really think about what exactly they are doing, it quickly becomes clear that many of them died from disease, and there was also a good chunk of people who suffocated on the job as well. In our number 6 spot today, we have a sin eater. Okay, this is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this, they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread, they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically, sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. 
person. You know, both bad. In our number five spot today, we have the executioner. We have all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the medieval times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. Well, there is, of course, now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge, hooded, evil people. History shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people, of course, saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience. Other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence. And most commonly, people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious. Another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. In our number four spot today, we have cat gut. Back in the medieval times, they didn't have the technology we have now, or even the technology that was available in the 17th century when it came to making strings for instruments such as the violin, but they still did have violins around, so how? Well, in comes the invention of cat gut, which thankfully is not made of cat guts, but it is made of sheep's guts. Okay, really had you in the first half there. Violin string makers during this time would make the strings by basically twisting strands of sheep innards together. Their job would require them to butcher the animal in a very careful way, making sure not to rupture the stomach or the lower intestines. The process could take hours just to get the required materials from the animal. The insides then needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution for a good cleaning, but they needed to be monitored at all times to ensure that they weren't beginning to spoil, which is horrible. From here, the drying process began, and after that, it was time for twisting. In our number three spot today, we have the rat catcher. Another job that really is just what it sounds like. Rat catchers had quite a busy time during the medieval times. There was a rat problem, and these rats were filthy and full of disease, and someone needed to catch them. Castles were often filled with extra grain, vegetables, and herbs in the case of emergency, and this led to the perfect environment for rats and mice. Even before the connection were drawn between rats and disease, people hated them, and this is because they would eat your food. A bad rat infestation for a person without much actually could have been a death sentence for them during this time. This meant that people really appreciated rat catchers in society, although the job wasn't a great one, was clearly risky, and also was largely ineffective. Rat catchers would sometimes try and use spells, sometimes they would use herbs as a sort of poison, and sometimes they'd even use the good old leave the body as a warning to the other rats trick. Yeah, wonder why it didn't work. In our number two spot today, we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring. It's basically like a human hamster wheel, but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure, and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said, you know, structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the Middle Ages. This was actually a job that was commonly given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. In our number one spot today, we have the lime burner. Lime mortar has been a common and important building material for years, stemming back to the first century BC, but despite its importance, it's not exactly easy to work with. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone and and this was the job of a lime burner. They needed to take the stone and heat it in a kiln at around 800 degrees Celsius. Sounds easy enough, for sure, except for the fact that the job meant that you were constantly being exposed to rooms full of carbon monoxide and dust chalk that was capable of removing your ability to breathe. And also, just to top it all off, there's also a high risk that once the stone was done heating, it might also explode if it comes into contact with water. So. Better hope none of your sweat drips down onto it or else things are not good. Yeah.